In this final session coming up before our panel discussion, John Whistle, Head of Policy at UK Bus at First Group, will continue the whole system perspective that Deborah in introduced. First Group has, it set, has set itself some very ambitious targets and we've invited John to share some details with us and how they're looking to achieve these. We've also asked them though to highlight where the interaction between companies like First Group, local network operators and city councils and government are essential to, to be able to decarbonise at speed. Finally, Sarah Petrie from EMSIT will pull together all the elements of the previous speakers and give us some insights into the project at the old Michelin Tire Factory, which she'll introduce as EMSIT, where they're establishing an innovation zone, a manufacturing district and a skills programme that will come together to demonstrate that the development of a low carbon mobility sector can actually drive substantial economic benefit to Scotland. After this session, we'll be going straight into the panel session. Hello everyone, John Bertwistle here. Head of Policy at First Bus, and we're talking about decarbonisation of bus transport. We have already committed within First Bus not to purchase any new diesel buses after 2022 and to have a fully decarbonised bus fleet by 2035. So that's 5,000 buses, a substantial number across the UK. So we are looking at electric power and hydrogen fuel cell power for decarbonisation. They're the only real alternatives available to bus operators today. But of course, five, ten years ago, um, they were really in their infancy. So we're talking about best available technology at the moment um, and, and planning for the next 14, 15 years. To be able to decarbonise our fleet, fundamentally, we need to be able to replace the buses that are in it already with new buses, not even electrical or hydrogen fuel cell buses, buses of some description. And that means we need to have a business case for investment. That means we need to be able to operate efficiently. And that means that we need bus priority. Bus priority is the key to decarbonisation of bus fleets across the UK. We need to be able to maximise the use of those assets. We need to be able to replace them when the time comes with something that will do the job better. And we need to be able to offer services to the passenger, which are quick and are reliable. Operators can ensure service punctuality and reliability by padding out the schedules to make sure that we can always operate a time at every stop, but that creates longer journeys for passengers. And that means that the passengers are not interested. They won't use the buses. And even more importantly, people will not shift mode from private vehicles to public transport unless services are rapid and punctual. So the first prerequisite to achieve just transition has got to be bus priority and the opportunity for operators to run efficient, and attractive services. But modal shift really is the key to achieving decarbonisation because public transport and buses in particular, not only can they achieve decarbonisation, but they can minimise the amount of local airborne pollution as well. Um, they can make the maximum use of the available road space, which is a constrained resource. So it is improving um, economic efficiency as well within the local area and they can achieve social integration they can achieve equality across all elements of society those people who are able to drive those who are not able to drive those who can afford a car those who can't afford a car and more importantly those who choose not to use a car for their transport so public transport is universal it delivers social equality economic improvements and environmental improvements. So how can this be encouraged? Well, we need help not just with the efficient use of road space to deliver these attractive um, and efficiently operated services, but we at the moment need help with overcoming the price premium of decarbonised buses. So you have a capital cost premium, which can be quite substantial and again requires cash flow and the resources to be able to invest at the time when the fleet is renewed. We also need assistance with depot connections, not the actual recharging facilities alone, which do have a significant cost, but also connections to the depot. 
So we've got issues ranging from the national and strategic. So this is grid capability, grid capacity through the local distribution network within the wider environment of where the depot is based right into the depot itself, the depot connection, all of which cost money, all of which take a lot of time to get sorted out. At the moment, we are electrifying our Caledonia depot in Glasgow, just south of the city center. The depot is the largest bus depot probably in the UK at the moment with a theoretical capacity of over 400 buses. And we are decarbonizing the fleet at Caledonia. In advance of COP26, we will have 24 fully electric single deck buses and they will be complemented with a further 126 over the next 12 months, giving us a fleet of 150. We've got 80 charging stations which are being implemented at the moment. The first 11 are already live. Each of these charging stations can charge two vehicles overnight. So it is a massive recharging facility, certainly one of the biggest in the UK, and it will enable us to operate a high proportion of the Glasgow City Network with electric vehicles. But of course, the Glasgow City Network is largely urban, fairly short duty services, which can be relatively easily decarbonized with electrical power. So if you're talking of a duty of between 150 and 200 miles per day, you can probably just about electrify those. But looking further afield, looking at rural services, whether the services themselves are longer or because of their, uh, their day of operation, the number of hours over which they're operating in any given day, the total duty length can be perhaps 300 or even more, 350 miles in a day. And these services cannot currently be electrified using standard overnight charging. So you need to look at alternative means of achieving this. There are various options available. You can have pantograph charging where a device on the bus roof raises to meet an overhead charging station, or you can have inductive loops in the road, in the road surface. Um, which will transmit a charge to the bus, both of which are high intensity charges and can be used to give the bus shorter bursts of energy during the course of the, of the day. Um, or the alternative is to actually have a layover period in the middle of the day where particularly a rural service may accommodate this um, in its outer satellite town or village. And the bus will take a conventional longer, slower charge during that period. But all these require infrastructure investment. This requires partnership working between the bus operators and the local authorities and between the electrical power suppliers to ensure that these facilities are available. Not just available in terms of they're physically there, but available at the time the bus needs them. So during that layover period or at the time when the bus is picking up passengers at the bus station in the uh, in the case of a, a pantograph or an inductive charging system, which of course requires that the correct space is available in that facility and not occupied by another vehicle. So we've got longer term solutions for the rural decarbonisation agenda, one of which is the additional electric charging, but the other is hydrogen fuel cell. But hydrogen fuel cell is at a much earlier stage of development at the moment. It's expensive. It's even more expensive in terms of the cost premium than electrical power. It's also got additional costs for workshop facilities, which need to be kept separate from those of the rest of the fleet for safety reasons and for operational procedures, particularly maintenance procedures. And the technology is comparatively um, in its infancy, the capabilities of the buses in the longer term are not as well known. However, using green hydrogen, it can be um, even cleaner potentially than electrical power, uh, given that the only emissions from the vehicle are water vapor. So within first, we've now got 15 double deck hydrogen fuel cell vehicles in operation in Aberdeen. And we expect to have some more in the next 12 to 18 months. We have to acknowledge with gratitude and um, praise for the forward thinking approach, Transport Scotland's support 
through the Scottish ultra low emissions bus schemes, which have helped us implement the schemes at both Caledonia and Aberdeen. Um, and we see these as having uh, great application for the future, helping us decarbonize the fleet even further and meeting our 2035 targets. But there are other issues to do with the greening of the bus fleet and decarbonization. And one of those is to do with skills. And not just bus drivers, but engineers as well need to be retrained in dealing with these modern vehicles. We will only realize the full potential of electrical buses and hydrogen fuel cell buses when entire depots have been decarbonized. And until that point, operational efficiency is going to be compromised. But nevertheless, we need to strive for this full decarbonization. The vehicles themselves can be attractive to passengers. They're quieter, they are smoother running. They will help us in our efforts to achieve modal shift, but only if accompanied by those bus priority measures that we all need to see. And that way we think we can actually achieve our objectives, which really are a greener, cleaner, more efficient provision of transport. And one that, as I said earlier, is available to all sectors of society. Concentrating on decarbonisation of transport has potentially got the risk of delivering a dystopian solution. One where we have as many cars on the road as we do today, causing as much congestion as we do today. And the only actual benefit is a reduction in carbon production because they're all electrically powered. However, we can achieve a utopian solution by first of all, achieving modal shift and accompanying that with decarbonization of public transport. And that will yield the full suite of benefits. But that's not the end. We can go further. We can extend the reach of public transport into the future by combining the decarbonized operation of electric vehicles with, in due course and appropriate circumstances, autonomy. Providing vehicles that extend the range of the public transport network into those areas where today it is simply not sustainable to operate public transport services because of the cost of providing driving staff. So by autonomous operation, we can provide public transport that goes beyond current networks and feeds into current networks and extends the range and opportunity for modal shift much deeper into areas that today are very difficult to serve or indeed are simply uneconomic to serve. And that's why we're working on the multi-cav project in Oxfordshire to determine not just the practicalities of delivering um, autonomous vehicles in public transport service, but also to assess public reactions to them and to identify what is and what is not acceptable for using such services as part of future public transport. Initially, with safety drivers in place to meet the current legislative requirements, but in due course, potentially on a fully automated basis. And this will help extend public transport, achieve modal shift into areas where today it is practically impossible to, uh, to, to deliver. So that's the future. That's the long-term future. The short-term future is we've got the Caledonia Depot, electrification well underway now, 24 fully electric buses by the time that COP26 takes place. I just encourage you all to go out and use them. Thank you very much. Goodbye.